All right. After nearly three weeks touring through Takayama, Hiroshima, Osaka, and finally Kyoto, it's time to return to Tokyo. So we loaded ourselves up like pack mules and headed to the train station. We looked slightly crazy. We had booked our Shinkansen bullet train tickets ahead of time and rushed to get here, but honestly, while we were standing on the platform waiting for our train, like five other trains heading from Kyoto to Tokyo came and went. What an awesome system. The whole trip was really only about three hours, so we ate some snacks we bought on the platform, but really we were there in no time. And the whole process was so much more relaxing than a flight, or a drive for that matter. It was funny, returning to Tokyo after three weeks felt almost like returning home. Watching tourists trying to figure out the subway system while we were navigating it effortlessly felt strangely validating. And now we're back in our friend's apartment. Oh, you bag marks. Oh my gosh. Home at last. We chose to be back in Tokyo this week very specifically. This week is Golden Week in Japan. April the 29th is a holiday in Japan, as well as May 3rd, 4th, and 5th. This means that there's seven days with four holidays in it. So many businesses will just give people the extra days, or they'll fall on weekends anyway. And so Japanese people do a lot of traveling this week, including within Japan. Which means hotels and attractions tend to become very expensive, or at least in demand during this week. So, we decided that would be the perfect time to leave Kyoto, which is a popular destination even for Japanese people, and return to Tokyo, where we could stay in my friend's apartment for free! We also needed to be back in Tokyo at some point because we were flying out of the nearby airport. Anyway, this week we intentionally took it easy. We knew we were going to be a little traveled out, and we wanted to relax and just live in Tokyo before we left. That being said, we usually got up to at least one thing a day, like visiting some of the districts that we didn't visit at the start of the trip. So I'm just going to go through some of them pretty quickly here. Shinjuku is a nightlife district with many bars and clubs, etc. We ate at an izakaya, which is kind of like an appetizer bar, think tapas, and they sat us in the back so that we didn't scare away Japanese customers. I spoke just enough Japanese that he didn't turn us away. While walking home, we noticed everyone else on the street was looking towards us, which was kind of creepy. When we looked up, we noticed it was a Shinjuku landmark we honestly forgot existed, which is this Godzilla looking over the buildings. It occasionally lights up and makes sound, and we just happened to be walking under it at the right time. Also, minor rant here, but they were advertising a lot on the train for this game called Viking Rise, and I was like, dude, those are clearly pirates. Continuing on, Akihabara is a popular district known for manga, electronics, and gaming. We're not particularly into manga, and we don't need any electronics, but we went through a few of the stores anyway, just to get a sense of them. Then we played a few games in an arcade, because we were here. It was fun, but we sucked. Some of those dudes were really good. Shimokitazawa is a hipster district that has a lot of vintage clothes and coffee shops. It was fine, but not really our style. We did find a yarn store, though. We returned to Shibuya, a commercial district, home of the famous Shibuya Scramble Crossing. We were here to get some souvenirs for people, including at the Disney store. I'm not much of a Disney person, but this store was pretty cool. If I'm going to be here anyway, may as well make it interesting. From there we walked to a nearby district of Daikanyama. It's a very upscale, trendy district, and we were here to visit a branch of Tsutaya Books, which is an upscale bookstore. Beautiful to walk around, but I didn't film inside because it was quite busy. On the way home we ate a Gogo curry, which is a different chain than Koko Ichibanya. We preferred our Koko Ichibanya. We also returned to Tokyo Station to get some stuff. It's interesting because the first time we were here, we were overwhelmed. Let me play that clip from you from our first Tokyo video. Honestly, a little bit, screw this place. We came here specifically because we were trying to find one of the shops that in the uh, attached shopping areas, and 
there were so many maps and they connected to different parts and then the different parts didn't have each other on the map. It was a mess. But now, three or so weeks later, it seemed fine. We could navigate it with no trouble and find what we wanted. So we want to go do, we want to dip back in this way, see if we can find food again. While there, we ate oyakodon, which is chicken and egg over a bed of rice. Damn good. Harajuku is a district known for quirky youth culture and shopping. We walked through, but didn't see much for us. We did find a nice place to get waffles with ice cream, though. One of the holidays during Golden Week is Children's Day, which is associated with these carp streamers. We were walking past Tokyo Tower on this day, and they had it decorated with these streamers, as well as having stuff for kids to do. Sunshine City is a mall in the district of Ikebukuro. Here we found another Studio Ghibli store, which was a pretty nice one. A very popular store here is the Pokemon Center, which had a line that was way longer than we were interested in. That line is going one way, then wrapping around and coming back the other way. Out front they had cute statues though. We visited a few other stores too. Seemed nice. We also hung out on the roof seating area thing, but it was a bit windy for us. A big chunk of one of the floors was dedicated to a giant Gachapon collection. Gachapon are like fancy versions of those capsule dispensers you see in lobbies. So you would put in money and get a random little like figurine or something. There were so many, and all different. Also in Ikebukuro, but not in Sunshine City Mall, we found a really nice fabric store, so that was a success. One night we did karaoke. Just the two of us. We went to a neat kind of shopping place called Hibiya Okuroki that had been built under but along the train tracks, like a, like a long thin mall. It has some neat stores. We returned to Sensoji Temple for some souvenirs. We visited here on our first week in Tokyo, and like with Shibuya and Tokyo Station, this time was nearly as busy, but that didn't bother us as much. I think because it wasn't new now, we weren't really looking to see the temple itself this time, so the people were just noise. Interesting. And finally, we visited Hibiya Park in Ginza while they were having some kind of a festival, probably related to Golden Week. There was live music, there was a huge food area, there was shaved ice, which was actually good compared to snow cones that I've had here. It's surprisingly not like mango. Yeah, it is a lot like mango. Very refreshing. It was a gorgeous park and a really nice day. Oh, it also had a robot that mowed the grass, which we watched for a while. So that was the quick overview of the minor stuff, but there's a few more interesting things we did, which I wanted to give a little bit more time to. One of the few things we actually booked during Golden Week was a kayak tour of Tokyo, and it was really cool. Our guide provided the boats and paddles, of course, but also the life jacket and all the gear, so we just had to show up on foot and he got us into the water. Looking back at the footage and Google Maps, I reverse engineered that we put boats into the water at Ojimo Kamatsugawa Park. From there we went up the Kyunaka River and then up the Kitajuken River to Tokyo Sky Tree. Seems like that was about 8 kilometers round trip, so not too far. Anyway, we had a very relaxed tour. Sometimes our guide would tell us stuff, but there would also be tens of minutes at a time where we were just quietly paddling through the city. We saw various and assorted water birds as we passed through their homes. It was also nice seeing people out enjoying the day on the riverbank or even in the river with us. While we were paddling, our guide also picked up any trash we encountered, which was sweet of him. When we got to the base of Tokyo Sky Tree, they had a bunch of carp streamers out, which was really cool to kind of boat into.
and after a quick break, we turned around and paddled home. It was a very peaceful and relaxing way to see another side of the city. Speaking of Tokyo Skytree, there are a few different places in Tokyo you can go to get a high vantage point over the city. Tokyo Tower, built in 1958, used to be the tallest, and many people still visit it today. It has two observation decks, one here, about 150 meters, or 490 feet up, and another here, about 250 meters, or 819 feet up. Going up to the first costs about 12-ish dollars per person, and going up to the second costs about 28 dollars per person. At least, that's what the website says. We walked under Tokyo Tower a few times on this trip, but we never went up. The other popular one is the aforementioned Tokyo Sky Tree, which was finished in 2012 and took over as the tallest tower in Japan. It has observation decks here at 350 meters, which is 1,150 feet, and another here at 450 meters, which is 1,480 feet. Tickets cost about $21 per person on the day of to go here, and $31 per person to go here. But if you book in advance, that becomes about $18 per person and $27 per person. At least that's what the website says. We kayaked near Tokyo Sky Tree, but we never went up. No, we were strangely cheap and principled about this, of all things. So instead, we headed to the Tokyo Metropolitan Government Building's free 45th floor observatories. We got here on the subway. It's a little bit non-obvious and a surprisingly long walk, but there were occasional signs guiding us. <laughs> I'm sure the paid towers are more obvious. On the plus side, the lobby had this micro exhibit on various invasive and native species. Like, this is comparing the palm civet, raccoon, badger, and tanuki. Despite being free, I encourage you to look the place up before coming. They have a kind of a weird schedule. There's a north and a south tower, and they're not always open. I'll admit, being the free option in a government building, I kind of expected this to be like a little window or something you were allowed to look out, but it was a real observatory. This observatory is about 202 meters or about 663 feet tall. So nearly as tall as Tokyo Tower, but not as tall as Tokyo Skytree. I thought the views were great, nicer than I was expecting, if I'm being honest. Really, the biggest problem is just that the South Tower, where we were today, couldn't look north because the North Tower was in the way. And if the North Tower had been open today, I'd be saying the same thing about the South. But all in all, we were satisfied. We didn't feel the need to visit either Tokyo Tower or Tokyo Skytree on this trip. So to summarize the lookout situation, the towers are Tokyo Tower at 150 meters and 250 meters, Tokyo Metropolitan Government at 205 meters, and Tokyo Skytree at 350 meters and 450 meters. The costs are, at the time of recording this, 12-ish dollars and 28 dollars, free, and then either 21 and 31 dollars or 18 and 27 dollars if you book in advance, all per person. The other thing that may be worth considering is that, in the city, Tokyo Tower is down here, Tokyo Skytree is over here, and Tokyo Metropolitan Government Building is over here. As for the views, I was only in the Metro Building, so here's some photos I grabbed off Wikipedia for the others. This is Tokyo Skytree Deck, the lower one, and Galleria, the highest one. And this is the photo I grabbed for Tokyo Tower. I don't know which platform, but I assume the higher one? By the way, you can't just magically see Mount Fuji from Skytree only. If the weather is right, you can see it from the Metro Building too, and if the weather's wrong, you won't see it from either. So anyway, that's our Observation Tower observations. One of our days, we went to the nearby city of Yokohama. It's not technically in Tokyo, but it's pretty close. Probably unsurprising by now, but we took the train. It only took about half an hour, which is honestly as long as it took us to get some places in Tokyo. It was a beautiful day, and even just walking through the shops on this street was fun. But that's not the main reason we came to Yokohama. While we were walking, we stopped at this bridge to look and saw all this trash floating in the water. Then we noticed it was only in the sunbeam, and then looking closer we realized these weren't plastic bags, but a whole bunch of jellyfish. This also isn't why we came to Yokohama, but it was pretty cool to see. We were in Yokohama to visit a very special boy. This was Gundam Factory Yokohama, 
I say was because we visited this place in May of 2023, but I'm making this video in April of 2024, and it looks like Gundam Factory Yokohama closed about a month ago at the end of March 2024. Anyway, this is another full-scale statue of a Gundam, based on the very popular anime. If you recall, we had already visited another life-size Gundam during our first week in Tokyo, which I also really liked, so why would I visit another? Well, first of all, they depict two different Gundam mobile suits, specifically RX-0 and RX-78F00. But more importantly, this second Gundam is not simply a statue. It played a kind of story with voice acting over the speakers during the show, but my Japanese isn't good enough to have followed it. It doesn't move very fast, but I thought it was still pretty cool. <laughs> it's also not actually a freestanding robot, but more like a puppet attached to the rig around it. Still neat though. This is them resetting it for the next show. And look at how cool it looks sped up a bit. I think they did a great job, and I don't regret going. It was always meant to be temporary. If anything, we were lucky. It was originally only meant to run until the end of March 2022, but that was postponed a year to 2023 because the country had its borders closed for COVID, and so many foreign tourists couldn't see it. I still would have missed it though, but the influx of tourists that spring pushed it out another year to March 2024, so I was lucky to get to see it at all. And between shows, they also had a tiny little museum you could visit. It talked a little bit about where the real robotics is at, and about the engineering that went into building this thing. If I'm being honest, I'm not even a Gundam fan in particular. I just like people doing cool stuff. And this kind of bold project was clearly built with passion and love, and then we all came to see it. It brought people together. Someone said, why couldn't we build one of these? And then they got a team of talented people together and did it. I'm here to celebrate someone choosing to do something cool. Anyway, that was that. From here we, oh wait. Hmm. Yeah, okay. From here we were still in Yokohama for most of a day. Right off the pier from the Gundam was a beautiful garden that was having a garden design contest, I think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was time for lunch and we thought, where could we get something to eat? Well, how about Coco Ichimanya curry? We were sort of addicted by now. After that, we walked past this tiny amusement park, but didn't feel particularly inspired today. But there was this guy walking his tortoise. We heard that there was a cup noodle museum, cup noodle being a particularly popular brand of instant ramen. So they talk about how they make them, etc. We went in, but they were like, hell no, it's golden week and we are fully booked, which is fair. We didn't have a reservation and just happened to be in the area. We were a little thirsty and looking for somewhere to just hang out and we found this cool place. You would rent a barbecue from them and then buy charcoal and pre-prepared meats and veggies and skewers and stuff, and then set up at one of their tables with your friends and grill up what you just bought. I thought it was a great idea because you could show up off the bus, carrying nothing, meet your friends and still have a barbecue together. Anyway, we sat on the grass and enjoyed our juice, and this kid kept screwing with his tap and getting water everywhere, which was funny from back here. 
Oh, oh, this was cool. So there was a big major intersection below us here, but we were on this walkway that came up from each corner, circled around, and then went back down. So, you could go from any corner to any other corner without having to interact with the cars. And for that matter, the cars didn't have to wait for the pedestrians either. Win-win. It's always weird when you see a lot of people going somewhere that you're not. Like, huh, I don't know what's in that building, but it looks popular. Oh yeah, Yokohama also has a famous Chinatown. But you know what? It's also just Chinatown. It's nice, but it's not a lot different than the one in, like, San Francisco. Or even Toronto or Montreal, honestly. Not bad, just not new to us. And then we closed out our trip by walking around a high-end pen and stationery store. Buying nothing, but it was fun to look. One of the disadvantages with traveling by train is that you have to carry all your stuff. Or do you? We actually solved this problem several times throughout our trip by relying on the wonderful Yamato Transport Company. Like, we had our smaller backpacks and then our larger backpacks, but because we were going between cities so much on this trip, it would have been inconvenient to carry them both all the time. Not impossible, of course, but harder. So like, when we were going to Takayama for a few days, and then from there to Hiroshima, we didn't even bother bringing our big bags to Takayama. We just packed all the things we might need for a day or two into our day bags, and then we shipped our big bags all the way to our hotel in Hiroshima. From Hiroshima to our hostel in Osaka was the same, so we swapped things between our big and little bags, did laundry in Hiroshima, and then shipped our big bags directly from our hotel in Hiroshima to our hotel in Kyoto, leapfrogging Osaka. That allowed us to travel to Osaka, and then later Osaka to Kyoto, with just our little bags, and our big bags were waiting for us in Kyoto when we got there. By the time we've arrived in Tokyo, we've accumulated not only fabric and yarn, but also souvenirs for ourselves and others. And our bags were already pretty stuffed when we came to Japan. So we went to Don Quixote and bought the sturdiest cheap suitcase we could find. Then we stuffed it with all the things we wouldn't need until we got back to Canada and went to Tokyo Station midway through our week to deal with it. When we got there, we felt bad it was so generic, so we went to the Tokyo Hand Store attached to Tokyo Station, which we went to during our first week, and bought some stickers to give it a bit of personality. There. Now this is our bag. Now all we had to do is head to the baggage service just inside Tokyo Station and ship our bag to the airport. Our flight wasn't for days at this point, but that's fine. We now don't have to worry about this bag or any of the things in it until we get off the train at the airport. Problem solved. I think it was like 20 or 30 bucks for them to ship our bag there and hold it until the day of the flight. We loved Yamato throughout our trip, though it doesn't hurt that their logo is a kitty. All right. So now our flight back to Canada is tomorrow, and we have one more full day in Tokyo. But, and this is lovely, we've already done everything we felt we needed to do. So we were able to spend the day just relaxing and enjoying the city, rather than rushing around getting last minute errands or sightseeing done. We hadn't been in a hot spring since Takayama, and Tokyo isn't as volcanically active as some other parts of Japan, but our friend said there was a real hot spring about half an hour away called Jomon Natural Onsen, so we went to that. I obviously didn't film inside because it's a private space, but I did film these lockers, which were pretty common in Japan. Every locker comes with a built-in key, you take it with you, and then return it when you're done. Obviously not super secure, but seemed like a pretty good balance between making it slightly harder to just grab someone's stuff, while still being very convenient. Okay, so that was really nice, but didn't take too long. We spent a good chunk of this afternoon just walking through the city, in a lot of cases retracing our steps from earlier in the trip. This is the first temple we visited in Tokyo. <laughs> it was much busier back then. In the week since we were last here, the main building is closed for construction. We've been here long enough to see things That's change. We earlier. That's Tokyo Tower again, peeking out in the background. Oh, it's late December. Interesting. We walked back to Ginza, past the dog statue and Kabuki Theater from our first week just soaking in the town on foot. I, uh, I doubt they're fake, given uh, how much work it looks like he's going into it. We wrapped up the evening eating sushi and ibisu with our friend. It was really good. Gathering, like, oh, I'm, hi, I'm Brendan. How's it going? Brendan's like, yeah. 
When we woke up the next morning, we found that our flight had been delayed from almost 5 in the afternoon to 10-ish, and then from 10-ish to 10.30, and then from 10.30 to 11-ish, which gave us almost another extra day. We started off the day with our last breakfast. This means some pre-packaged pancakes, first introduced in Osaka. Some hot hojicha from the hot drink machine we discovered for the first time in Hakone. And an onigiri pressed rice ball, like we had many times throughout the trip. A good, honest breakfast from the convenience store near our friend's apartment. We started many days eating at this Lawson's, and a fair number of dinners, too. It took care of us. There may be many Lawson's like it, but this one will always be ours. Speaking of lasts, for lunch we went to Kokoichi Banya for our last curry lunch. Kokoichi Banya made a very particular impression on us, and honestly we've been missing it ever since. Then we packed up our room. We spent nearly half of our trip in here, and it was our home in Japan. It was weird seeing it so empty. Now we're all loaded up and heading to the airport. Remember when we sent our souvenir bag to the airport? Yeah. I don't know why we didn't send our big backpacks to the airport at the same time. What were we thinking? Anyway, we rode the subway to the airport like this, and it honestly wasn't very comfy. We did make it, though. Speaking of our souvenir bag, it was waiting at the airport for us, just like we knew it would. Ta-da! Now we just had to walk from the Yamato place to the airport check-in to drop off both our big bags and our souvenir case. The duty-free did look pretty awesome, but we didn't need anything. There was one problem with the airport, though, which is that our flight was delayed from 5-ish to 11-ish, as I'm sure you recall. But everything in this terminal closed basically at 5. This was the only place we could get dinner, and it basically closed right after we got food. The people who arrived after us were getting hungry, so eventually the airline was forced to pass out some sandwiches. And that's it. We're flying above Tokyo, landing in Toronto, and the trip is complete. I will say, it was weird leaving Tokyo at 11pm on Tuesday, being in the air for 12 hours, and then arriving in Toronto at 10pm on the same Tuesday. (sighs) I guess I should say something here. I've been busy, and dragging my heels a little bit, honestly, and so I'm making this last video almost exactly one year since we got back, and we've missed something about Japan basically every day since. It was an amazing trip, and we were lucky to get to go on it, in many different ways. One of the ways we were lucky was that we had a friend in Tokyo. Being able to use his place at two key points in the trip, the first week while we were getting our bearings, and the last week during Golden Week, was an enormous help and really made this trip doable. Obviously, saving two to three weeks of hotel costs was a massive financial leg up, but even his knowledge of how things worked, places to eat, the things to do, was an incredible asset. Knowing we had someone we could ask about things gave us the safety net to be confident jumping into a few unknowns. So a huge thanks to him for all of that. So, how do you wrap up six weeks in Japan other than by saying it was the best six weeks of my life? too far I don't have waterproof shoes but he does seem pretty cute he's going for that garbage he's He's like Sharon is that you Sharon I lost my wife 10 years ago I've been looking for her ever since in this trash I'm pretty sure she looks like a bag
Thanks for watching. Okay. Mmm, true. And then like the park's over there somewhere. Hmm? Totally.